there are a couple reasons why um, I am doing that. One is I grew a little dissatisfied with the lack of accumulation of knowledge or evidence um, in the studies of uh, electrophysiology that I was um, looking at. Uh, so let us say there is one lab doing research in primate electrophysiology and over many years or decades they build up a body of research but another lab that does research on primate electrophysiology builds up their own line of research. It, it's not like um, <coughs> the research of group A accumulates on the research of group B and part of the difficulty is uh, what Moritz was hinting at um, with the little diagram that he drew about the difficulty of inferring what's inside a box by measuring the responses of the box to stimuli because there's an in, a very large infinity of things you can probe the box with um, and uh, uh, it is not really possible experimentally to throw in all these stimuli in, into a box and what happens especially if the box is very complicated is you end up studying the laboratory rather than the box because that particular laboratory has a set of choices of what kind of environment they like to subject the box to. Now ethologists of course have a different approach. They study organisms in their natural environments. Um, however that <clears throat> does not always lend itself to the kind of experimental um, manipulations that, that people would like. So I think that one of the satisfying things about neuroanatomy is that um, it does accumulate. Um, if uh, one opens Kahal, one can still use that evidence and, and build upon it. It doesn't become obsolete, it's very concrete. Um, it is at the same time limited because we do not have the physiological information when we study anatomy. Uh, but what I found to my surprise really uh, some years ago when I started looking into this is how little we do understand neuroanatomy. It is only now that with electron microscopy we are starting to disentangle the uh, microcircuits in great detail. But even at the level of um, classical neuroanatomy where people studied um, projection patterns using tracers, uh, what I found was there were big gaps in knowledge and I uh, decided to uh, start a project to um, uh, try to close those gaps. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about that. Um, but before I do that, I wanted to um, uh, really uh, take you th through uh, a bit of a, a thinking exercise. Um, and this being a um, workshop on thinking about engineering principles, one of the engineering artifacts that we all uh, uh, use as a metaphor to study the brain in the modern day world is, is a computer. So people say computational models of the brain or the computations that perform are performed by the brain. So one question is, um, is the brain a computer? Um, how many people in this room would say uh, yes? Well, there's uh, some of you. Uh, how many people would say no? No, oh, several of you. <laughs> um, <clears throat> well, I guess to define what, uh, uh, to answer this question, is the brain a computer, we have to f first ask what a computer is. Because if we can't define what a computer is, it makes no sense to talk about if the brain is a computer or not, right? So then one should first define computers, namely specify what properties would make something a computer. And then we have to show that the brain, that brains have those properties. Um, one thing that I should say is that uh, uh, we should not think of the computer as a physical object because the, clearly, if we think of these instances of computers as we have in front of us, our brains do not belong to the set of physical objects that we typically call computers. So it's a more abstract property that we are talking about. And, and a better question to ask perhaps is, um, is uh, a computational model, is a model of computation useful for understanding brain function? That's in fact a more sophisticated way to ask this question. But anyway, I will just pose it more simply and ask what is a computer? So according to the strong church Turing thesis, computation is what Turing machines do. So one could boil down this question and ask, can the brain be modeled usefully by a Turing machine? Right? So this is sort of the question. So to focus this question, um, 
I boil it down to um, one question. Does a Turing machine accept inputs while it is computing? And there's a question with a binary answer, either yes or no. So how many people think the answer is yes? How many people think the answer is no? Some people are undecided, but most people think the answer is no, that Turing machines do not accept inputs while it is computing. Um, now the brain, as far as we know, <laughs> accepts inputs while it is doing things. Um, and this is why Turing machines are, in fact, not very good models of what the brain does, because it's constantly but, but accepting that inputs. Computer, that's both, right? I mean, no, no it's, not a, it's not a matter of analog versus digital, um, although the Turing machine is a digital model. Um, one could imagine an analog version which still doesn't accept inputs. The point is that the Turing machine, the way the model is set up, is that you set it up with a problem, then you let it go, you don't disturb it while it is doing its thing. And then it either comes out and gives an answer, yes or no, or it never halts, but you can't actually perturb it while it is doing its thing. That's not a part of the Turing model. Are you talking about online versus offline? No, I'm talking about the Turing model. So Turing defined a model of computation. And the model of computation is, um, you know, there is an infinite tape and so on and so forth. But it starts with a finite input. And you don't perturb it while it is computing. This is kind of, uh, you know, seems like a pedagogical exercise. But this is very important. Uh, the point I'm making here is discourse must be precise. We always talk about brains as computers. People talk about computation. But they don't really define what they're talking about. And if one is using these terms in a loose, non-technical way, that's fine. But I think as scientists, we have to use terms in, in technical ways. Um, and this whole debate about the brain being a computer often becomes a debate about uh, somebody is secretly a dualist and thinks that there is a soul hanging off from the pineal gland. <laughs> and that's why the brain is not a computer. But that's not what I'm getting at. I'm saying that, technically speaking, <laughs> there is a, a, a model uh, uh, made by Turing. And there are other models people have made of computation. Um, for example, people have made models of real computation, but following the Turing uh, uh, method, um, you know, Turing idea. OK, so there is more to this uh, story. So the, so the answer is uh, no, it doesn't. And that's why um, uh, Turing, machines, Turing machines are closed. They don't accept inputs during the computations. They accept a finite string in the beginning. Then they do recursive calculations either halt and produce a resulting string or do not terminate. Here's the irony that even what we call computers are not modeled well by Turing machines. right? So it's not just a property of brains, but a property of our own laptop or personal computers that uh, they are, in fact, constantly interacting with the environment. Whether they be interacting with us, we are interacting with it, or they're on the internet and uh, um, you know, um, they are constantly getting messages from the outside. The operating system is con constantly interacting with the environment. So um, uh, this has led some computer. So some computer scientists are OK with this. And they are like, well, it, it, this is much ado about nothing. Um, one should only understand the algorithms using the Turing model. And um, you know, that's what you program your computers to do. But other computer scientists have. Uh, ex started exploring non-Turing models of computing that accept inputs while computing. They are called interactive models of computing. Uh, one way of thinking about it is, is it's taking a Turing machine which has got an infinite input. Because you can think of the input as coming in as a function of time or giving it all in at, at, uh, uh, you know, initially. But it's an infinitely long string that you give it. But in fact, I think one doesn't really need to develop a uh, theory of interactive computing. One already exists, and it's called control theory. Um, in fact, what control theorists do is to deal with interactive um, dynamical systems. Um, so we have a theory that deals with the behavior and design of interactive dynamical systems. So um, the reason I, I, I say this is that, uh, in a sense, this is a very fundamental question 
about brain architecture, what kind of engineering model or metaphor we are going to use in, in thinking about brains. And um, as you might see uh, from the topic of this workshop, we have uh, brought in control theory as an engineering theory to be thought about and discussed. Um, uh, that will be relevant for um, understanding uh, how the brain works. Um, Turing himself, uh, by the way, would have agreed that Turing machines, or what we call Turing machines, he didn't call it a Turing machine, he called it uh, A machines or automatic machines. And he, he, he knew that they are not very good models of what uh, the brain does. Um, in fact, uh, he took some time off to think about how to model brains, uh, spent a year doing this, um, came back with a manuscript, um, his uh, supervisor, then supervisor, severely criticized him. Um, apparently the manuscript was smudged um, and uh, the supervisor didn't think very highly of what Turing had spent his year doing. Um, and he never published it. He was so discouraged that he never published his paper and, and shortly thereafter he uh, either killed himself or died accidentally, it's not clear which. Um, but um, not because of this experience, but uh, perhaps something else. Um, uh, this paper was subsequently published. It's called uh, Intelligent Machinery. I uh, highly recommend that you read it if you haven't um, read it. Um, and in this paper, Turing theorizes about uh, brain function. He constructs actually artificial neural network models. He calls them B machines and P machines, P for pain, um, with plastic synapses that can be trained he foresees genetic algorithms and uh, so on and um, so forth. Um, so his supervisor said a bit thin for a year off. Schoolboy's essay and not suitable for publication. So when the reviewers send us back those lovely reviews which we get nowadays, we shouldn't get too discouraged. <laughs> Who was his supervisor? Uh, I forget the name, but that's the irony of it. <laughs> his supervisor is not known anymore, <laughs> having killed Turing's paper. <laughs> So that's a picture from uh, Turing's paper of a B machine schematic. Somebody has taken in, uh, take, taken you know his his work further. Um, so Turing describes how somebody whose brain was modeled by a universal Turing machine, um, the A machine, would behave, um, and then he suggests that one should study Turing machines, but only as an intermediate step to studying something better. Um, he says. All of this suggests that the cortex of the infant is an unorganized machine which can be organized by suitably interfering training. The organizing might result in the modification of the machine into a universal machine or something like it. This would mean that the adult, he here is where he describes the human Turing machine, will obey orders given in appropriate language even if they were very complicated. He would have no common sense, <laughs> so if you told him to do something that didn't make sense, he'd still do it. Um, uh, and would obey the most ridiculous orders unflinchingly. When all his orders had been fulfilled, he would sink into a comatose state or perhaps obey some standing order such as eating. Creatures not unlike this can really be found, but most people <laughs> behave quite differently under many circumstances. So um, <laughs> he, uh, um, however, the resemblance to a universal machine is still very great and suggests to us that the step from the unorganized infant to a universal machine is one which should be understood. When this has been mastered, we shall be in a far better position to understand how the organizing process might have been modified to produce a more normal type of mind. Um, so, you know, I would say that I, I, I don't call brains computers. It, it doesn't make sense to me for many different reasons. Uh, at the same time, I'm, I do not want to say that Mod, the model of computation that Turing built is not useful for understanding some aspects of what brains do. I think it is eminently useful, in fact. One has to use it as one of several theoretical frameworks that are uh, useful in that manner. Um, uh, to understand it better, um, I think we cannot just go by the Turing test, which is essentially how um, behavioral neuroscience works. You, you, you try to put in inputs, observe the outputs, and sometimes the outputs are observed by um, 
putting electrodes into the brain, in some sense that's still an output of some sort that one is measuring because one is not measuring the full uh, complexity of the system. And from this one is trying to figure out what the brain does. Um, the Turing test is not really adequate. Um, it doesn't give enough information about the, uh, about the system. Um, and one needs to look inside and figure what the circuits uh, are. Um, from an evolutionary perspective, I think if we can find circuits that are convergently evolved, that appear circuit motifs that appear multiple times in multiple phylogenetic lines, um, it would be interesting, for example, to know that these uh, predictive coding circuits that are uh, perhaps implemented in visual systems of the fly or the mouse, if one were able to show that uh, they are indeed convergent. I, I don't know if that will be the case because we don't know what the Ur Bilaterian had in its visual system and we you know, didn't fossilize. Sorry? Maybe they're divergent. Uh, that, that's also possible that uh, um, they uh, do not, uh, that they implement the same, um, they solve the same problem but in different ways. Um, that's also possible. But um, uh, I, I, I think it is intriguing at least, uh, this possibility that um, to solve a particular problem that the organism has to solve, um, one can, or different organisms have evolved the same circuit motif. If, if that is the case, then that would make a, um, uh, you know, that would be strong evidence that in fact one has discovered an important underlying um, principle um, that governs the nervous system. So uh, let me uh, move on here. Um, so as I said, I, I was struck by uh, how sparse the neuroanatomical information was when I first started looking at this problem. And um, this happened when I heard a talk by uh, Larry Swanson, um, and he and Mihail Bota had compiled this matrix which has since be, been uh, revised, but it's some kind of connectivity diagram as Moritz was showing for his thousand neurons. This is now a 500 by 500 matrix. This is not between individual neurons, but between brain regions as defined in uh, neuroanatomical terms. And the remarkable thing about this matrix was that most of it was um, uninvest um, was blank because it had not been investigated. Um, now, one may debate about how sparse this matrix really is because uh, this represents a certain body of literature and um, one of the problems is that nobody has actually read all of the literature. It, it's impossible to read, so we cannot really collate this information. Even if theoretically we have a lot of information scattered in the neuroanatomical literature, it, it is difficult to in fact pull in all that, all that information into one um, uh, <clears throat> combined data set. But even if one took all the literature, one would probably find um, significant um, holes in it, uh, the reasons for which will become clear as I uh, proceed in my talk. But this is to be contrasted with the explosion that has happened with genomics knowledge where people have uh, mapped out complete genomes. Um, and uh, so I, um, had a series of meetings and uh, together with uh, a number of colleagues proposed that one set out to rectify um, this situation where um, uh, that matrix that was presented for the mouse, which was mostly empty, uh, we start trying to fill it in, um, uh, but also do it not just for mouse but for other, in fact the matrix I showed you was for rat. Uh, not for mouse. Um, for, for mouse, that matrix is truly empty because people haven't really probed the connections in mouse, although one would uh, expect uh, that at this level uh, there would be strong uh, homologies between the mouse uh, and, and the rat. Um, however, um, filling in the matrix and doing it in multiple species uh, seems like a promising uh, research direction uh, to go in. And so what we propose to do is to uh, do um, kind of a grid-based uh, shotgun-like approach for whole brain uh, connection mapping. And the idea was to define a roughly equidistant uh, injection grid 
um, in the brain. Uh, I'll show you pictorially uh, what that means. Um, in separate mice, inject each grid point with uh, 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 tracer substance, um, tracer substance that have been used classically by neuroanatomists like cholera toxin and biotinylated dextran means uh, also um, uh, viral tracers uh, like AAV or modified rabies viruses. Uh, there are both anterograde tracers and retrograde tracers. So the idea is that um, there are active transport processes along axons where the uh, cell body sends uh, material down the axon to synapses or material gets transported from synapses back to the cell body. And these existing biological processes can be hijacked by or, or can be uh, used by the uh, tracer substances that we inject that are taken up by neurons and then either transported anterogridly or retrogridly, thus filling the cell. Um, an important cav a note, a side note, is that this is not possible to do in humans. Um, we had a, uh, during one of these Banbury conferences, Cliff Saper suggested that um, anybody who's really interested in this project should uh, volunteer to take an injection in their brain <laughs> when they are at a certain stage and uh, you know, uh, donate their brains after uh, in a post-mortem state. <laughs> but uh, short of that, uh, in the human brain, we cannot do this. We cannot inject a tracer, watch this active transport process, and then section the brain. Um, and because diffusion grows as a square root of time and doesn't grow linearly in time, if you put in a diffusive tracer, uh, so dye I, a lipophilic uh, dye which is used also for tracing um, neural processes in postmortem human brain, uh, doesn't diffuse very far in the experimental time scales that we've had available to us. So this method doesn't work in humans. And, and therefore, we know practically nothing about how the human brain's connected any more so than we did 100 years ago. Um, and then the idea was to section uh, these brains um, uh, into a series of uh, sections, uh, just like Moritz uh, was showing with the uh, EM, um, it's the same uh, in, in one of the methods in EM where you cut uh, serial sections. It's the same kind of idea except the sections here are thicker. There are 20 micron sections that we cut. Um, and um, otherwise, uh, it's the same task of uh, histochemical processing, uh, digitization, uh, registration, and uh, uh, quantification. Um, so uh, there is this notion of a mesoscopic scale. and. I want to talk about that uh, for a minute. Now, uh, in the EM reconstruction, one is confined to rather small chunks of the brain right now. Um, uh, I think it's 100 microns by 100 microns or, or a millimeter. What is the largest EM volume that you think can be reasonably reconstructed at this point? Um, well, our hands right now, 500 microns on the side. 500 microns on the side. But that's changing. Right. Um, but let's say on the, on the scale of a millimeter, um, the mouse brain uh, has got uh, a thousand such uh, volumes in it. And um, even if one were able to do these volumes one by one independently, stitching them together would uh, be an extremely hard problem. So I think it right now is pretty much impractical to try to define a connectivity atlas at the individual synaptic level, as we saw in the fruit fly uh, visual system or the, or the retina, or hopefully soon in the barrel cortex. Um, and even if we could define this connectivity atlas at the individual synaptic level, there is, of course, individual variation and variation in time, so that um, uh, one would still have to discover uh, from that very high, uh, rich, uh, richly connected um, data set what the invariant properties are uh, that were the same from uh, individual to individual. Now, uh, neuroanatomists looking at um, cytoarchitectonic features, uh, starting with uh, uh, Broadman and, and others have been able to break the brain up into well-defined regions. Um, there is debate about how precisely to define these regions. One could do it cytoarchitectonically, cyto electrophysiologically with <laughs> input uh, stimuli or, or, or behaviors. 
uh, or one can also do it by looking at segregating projection patterns. And these things don't always give the same answers, but there is some overlap or correspondence between these different methods of parcelating the brain. Um, uh, but the bottom line is that uh, um, the brain can be divided up into these uh, regions between which one can think about um, projection patterns. Um, the, uh, so I've uh, spoken uh, about that. Uh, now, each of these sort of regions will still contain many cell types. So think of a region um, that will still have to be characterized in terms of its own cell types and internal um, connections. Um, and when we think about uh, sort of the projections between two regions, then one really would have to think about cell type specific uh, projections uh, along with transmitter and receptor information. Um, but uh, the truth is that we don't even uh, have the <coughs> connectivity matrix to begin with, which we will then pattern with the cell type. So that's kind of the uh, first step. Now, one caveat to keep in mind when one does this sort of mesoscopic analysis is that um, neurons are really uh, trees. And this is important because if there is brain region A, and then there is brain region B and C, and one observes, um, uh, if one puts in a tracer substance here and it appears in both of these brain regions, then it could be that a single neuron collateralized and went to these two different brain regions, or there were different neurons which uh, independently uh, went to these uh, brain regions. And now, this would be quite different architectures, and that's a subtlety that would not be captured in a connection matrix representation. So while at the synaptic level, one can try to write down the connection matrix, at this level, uh, the connection matrix, quote unquote, in fact, doesn't contain all the information. One really wants to keep track of where these uh, branching points also are. If you want, there are some hidden nodes to this uh, connection matrix. Another way to think about it is that one should really keep space in the picture and think about where the neurons branch. In fact, this might be a concern even for the um, EM-based uh, reconstructions that keeping track of the actual branching geometry of the uh, neurons is important. And I, I'm not sure anybody's quite thinking about that um, right now. Eventually, I hope uh, people will uh, think about these um, branching patterns and move beyond connection matrices. Um, so this is just a picture to show you that neurons are trees. Also to show you that um, uh, these are uh, pyramidal neurons in um, uh, rat. Uh, actually, I don't know if it is rat or mouse. This is a paper uh, by Lou Haberly. Um, and these are two different uh, neurons. Um, the uh, brain is not much larger than the span of these individual neurons, which makes the point that um, uh, there are these large scale projections and that single neurons can actually project to multiple brain areas um, at once. OK, so um, in fact, I have made some comments about EM here. Um, I don't know if the time scale is quite right. How long would it take to do a whole mouse brain with current technologies? Well, it depends on if you're referring to the, to the lip. Uh, no, no, not the 18, uh, the high, high, high resolution where you can get. So I think, yeah, <coughs> years after, yeah. So I think it's, yeah, that's. 100 years. Yeah, that's the time scale. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Hundred years. Hundred so current. Current technology is 100 years if we wanted to do what you know, we were just shown, but for the whole mouse brain. So now uh, we can get some, uh, um, hopefully we'll live longer by, I don't know, uh, biotech advances. It depends <laughs> on the size of the crowd that's source, right? <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. Just data so, so the data acquisition rate right now is um, something like 10 mega, 10 mega voxels. OK, so, so but no, it's, it's a pretty long time scale. Um, but one can go for um, a somewhat coarser EM reconstruction by looking at just myelinated fibers and looking at the trajectories of myelinated fibers. And I think Winfried is uh, trying to do that now, but it, that's still in methodological development from what I um, understood. Not all fibers are um, myelinated. Um, so as I said, what we are trying to do is, is sort of a shotgun approach. Um, the classical approach is more hypothesis driven. So one is investigating a particular brain region, one injects an anterior grade tracer, and one follows up with 
follows up on projections with retrograde traces to verify. So one goes from region A, looks at all the places where projections have gone to, and then goes there and injects some retrograde traces. Um, so the Van Essen diagram, for example, was generated using this kind of uh, 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 method. Um, so uh, what, what we are doing is different from the kind of hypothesis-driven method because we are placing these injection um, uh, grid points just by parcelating the brain. We are not um, specifically choosing a particular uh, brain region to, to target, but hopefully by assembling our data sets together, which, uh, uh, which have got both anterograde and retrograde um, uh, injections in them, <coughs> we will simply by chance, for example, supposing I put in anterograde tracer at this, at this point, um, uh, it will show some projection pattern across the brain. I'll show you pictures of that. But then I will, wherever that projection pattern is, I will be able to find a point where I have already injected retrograde tracer. So I'll be able to verify that um, connection. At least that is the idea. So there is a little uh, experimental pipeline we have uh, 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 constructed in the laboratory, and this started in uh, 2010. Um, January, we've been going hard at it since. We have over a thousand mice which have been um, injected, but there is also a loss rate because sometimes injections fail. We have about half our data set right now. We are still um, uh, compiling the other half. Um, by half, I mean uh, 250 brain sites um, and uh, four. Uh, tracers for each brain site. So some of the tracers are actually more complete at this point than the other one, so it's, it's a rough number. Um, so this is a, oops, little video which shows you how the, um, um, how the um, experimental lab looks like. That's just the physical layout of the lab. And this is um, <coughs> sectioning. Um, this is by hand. I guess in the EM case, this is automated. Um, we have this tape transfer method that we use. Um, then the um, rest of it, we try to use machines as much as we can. The histochemistry, um, some of the histochemistry is easy, like Nissel staining. And there are good uh, robotic devices to do that. Um, some of the histochemistry we were trying to do using robotic devices, but we ended up having to do by hand, but we do it all on slide processing. Each of these boxes uh, contain a couple brains. And then here you can see um, sort of the um, bottleneck in the project, which is the imaging. So these are robotic um, uh, slide scanners. Um, and you can still see that there's a manual step where um, something I can can move on from that, go to the website in a minute and, and explore it. But um, uh, what I wanted to uh, note there is that we try to use as much robotics as possible, but um, there are some manual steps, and there's also quite a bit of informatics, uh, because one has to stitch these different pieces um, together. It's not like one, one box, which would be really ideal. Another thing I want to point out is reason there is automation is not because somebody developed it for our project. It, it was developed for clinical reasons for doing uh, histopathology, especially the slide scanners. People are trying to do digital uh, histopathology. <coughs> the other uh, comment I want to make is the reason we are able to do this today as opposed to um, you know, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, uh, got a very mundane reason, which is that storage used to be very expensive. So one mouse brain at light microscope resolution is about a tera uh, voxels. So that's micron cubed voxels is about a tera, tera voxel. So about a terabyte of data. So in uh, 1989, just before the decade of the brain began, uh, it cost, uh, can anyone guess how much it cost in 1989 to store a terabyte of data? Some of you, I, you have to, any guesses? No guesses? No. Hmm? 5,000, any higher bids, no? Costs like millions of dollars. Yeah, I mean, you know, 
you'd have to buy giant stacks of floppies or hard disks or something. Um, so yeah, uh, that's one of the reasons we can do this project, which is we can actually store this digitized data set. Previously, uh, until recently, the um, standard has been to um, take photographs. It's only recently that people are actually digitizing the images, but previously people were simply even taking uh, non-digital analog photographs. Um, so I'm going to show you uh, some of the uh, project data now, but um, still work in progress. Um, <clears throat> but just to s uh, say what we plan to do with the data is to, um, for a given injection, we want to quantify the probability of finding a cell body somewhere else in the brain or finding a process in some other location. Um, and the idea is to do this for a reference strain. We are do doing this for C57 black uh, mice, uh, adult males. Um, but then the idea would be to repeat for mouse models and see how these projection patterns change in um, transgenics. Um, so these are examples of how the data looks like. Here's an injection um, into cortex. You can see a, a, a projection to the contralateral hemisphere. You, you, here you can see some terminations in, uh, in thalamus. Um, this is an injection of BDA, and it has been visualized using histochemical methods. The blue counter stain is called Gimza. So this is one of our tracers. So imagine, you know, now we have injections like this, but placed in different mice, placed in different uh, parts of the brain. Um, uh, this is uh, one of the viral tracers. So AAV is largely an anterograde tracer. It also has some retrograde labeling. Uh, this is uh, adeno-associated virus. Um, there are two different colors because we were trying to separate superficial from deep cortical layers. That didn't work out terribly well, but we did get some um, separation. Um, <clears throat> this is a motor cortex injection. Again, you can see um, the um, projection across to the other side of the hemisphere. These are projections going down to um, uh, the motor system and the thalamus. Uh, here you can see uh, some terminal. Sorry? What's the scale? Um, well, it is zoomable down to half a micron. Um, this is the mouse brain is about a centimeter across. So our pixels are half a micron big. Um, I'll show you that in a minute. Uh, you'll be able to explore it for yourself um, on the web. That's a cholera toxin injection. Um, this is supposed to be both a retrograde and an anterograde um, tracer. And this is a um, <coughs> rabies uh, virus injection. This is a retrograde tracer, but it produced sparse label. Um, so let's see here. You can see um, okay. This is a different injection. Sorry, we are also producing some auxiliary data sets. This is a myelin stained um, data set. We are doing it at the full brain um, level. So what does one do with the data like this? Now, we are just beginning that process of analysis. Um, in fact, have a little uh, collaboration with uh, Moritz trying to see if some of the EM reconstruction techniques can be brought over to this sort of mesoscale reconstruction. But uh, classically, what people would do is um, take the data, match it up to an atlas, look at projections, and say, projections appeared in this particular brain region. Now, uh, that's problematic for the following kind of reason. So uh, we pulled out um, the regions annotated in this database, um, the brain architecture management system put together by Swanson and Bota. Um, and so these are regions that receive projections from uh, motor cortex. Um, we have just uh, differently color-coded them uh, to emphasize the different regions. These are maximum intensity uh, uh, projections. Now, here are, um, for a particular uh, injection from our data, um, the corresponding regions that were manually found. So we just labeled the brain compartments in which there were projections. And you can see that the difficult, so the, we get roughly the same patterns. They're not quite exactly the same. But you can see what the difficulties are if I take a whole brain region and say projections went to this brain region, now I have lost all spatial information 
inside that region. And um, that's sort of a difficulty that's made clear by uh, looking at this image here. So ultimately, one really wants to retain that full three-dimensional uh, information that I started out with. Um, we hope to, uh, this is work in progress, um, uh, but uh, we have already started identifying um, new projections. That's something that you would expect because we are doing this in this sort of experimental manner. Um, I won't go through this in great detail, but um, uh, one of our collaborators, uh, Harvey Carton, um, uh, no, uh, identified um, uh, such a, a projection. So this is just um, uh, I'm trying to uh, channel uh, Harvey here out of some of his, uh, some of his uh, emails that he sent to me on observing um, this projection. So uh, uh, brief history of ascending projections from the tectum, uh, which have been uh, contentious. Um, so in birds, um, there's a very large uh, projection from retina to um, optic tectum, uh, which in uh, mammalian brains, uh, the, the superior, the equivalent of the superior uh, colliculus. Um, and one of the questions, therefore, was it, it, this projection also exists in our brain. So from the retina, um, apart from going to the LGN, there are also projections that go to the tectum, uh, to colliculus. And there was a, there's a question as to whether projections then go from tectum up to uh, thalamus. Uh, so is there a secondary pathway? Um, so Cajal, in fact, uh, uh, studied this question. And due to the limitations of the techniques that he had available to him, to him he concluded that the optic tectum of mammals does not contribute uh, ascending projections upon the um, thalamus. Um, and this would, of course, imply there, uh, there would not be any second order projections of the tectal outputs um, upon the cortex. However, um, uh, subsequently, uh, such projections were found. I won't go through all the different um, uh, examples here. Uh, the only thing is that uh, uh, they were not seen in mouse, or this is at least what Harvey has. Um, told me that he, he went looking for it in the rodent and couldn't find these particular projections that go from uh, tectum, uh, bilateral projections to thalamus. And uh, such a projection was there in our data set. And just to show you, um, so this is a BDA injection um, that you know we placed randomly. It, it wasn't placed specifically to find this particular um, projection. You know, this is just one of our points on the grid. And um, here are the two, here are the bilateral projections that uh, Harvey was looking for um, in this case. So I don't want to belabor this, but um, just to, that those are just uh, zoom ins. But just to make the case that since we are doing this in a shotgun manner, we expect to discover um, new projections. Um, we are making this data available, uh, the raw data, even before we have analyzed it in the hope that people will examine it. Um, so it's available to you. Uh, we have released uh, our first data set. And um, if you are working in rodents especially, I invite you to come and discover uh, projections which have not been studied before. It will be n equal to 1, but one could then perhaps do more um, hypothesis-driven uh, research. So uh, we gathered the data in coronal section, but these coronal sections can be stacked up. Um, uh, Florian from Morris's lab uh, helped us uh, do this uh, using uh, software they had actually developed for EM uh, reconstruction. And you can see that we can virtually re-slice the brain in other planes. Um, this is because of the tape transfer method that we use, that we preserve the sections fairly accurately. I should mention that there are other ways of gathering this data set. There is an equivalent method to the serial block face uh, sectioning that is also being used. Uh, now, that has a limitation because it's uh, currently confined to doing fluorescent microscopy, so you can't really do histochemistry on it. Um, if you notice here in this virtual reslicing, this little piece of choroid plexus is nicely preserved and is growing, going across. Section. So those are really detached pieces of tissue, if you were to 
to look at it from the point of view of the brain. So in fact, we, we do preserve morphology fairly well. Um, now, the goal that we have is to register to the atlas and then quantify um, just to show you some very preliminary work uh, or to show you that it is possible to do. Um, this is a, a rabies virus injection into, um, into the chordate nucleus and you can see in these displays all the detected cells in different parts of the brain from that particular injection. Um, I have started a collaborative project uh, with Marcelo Rosa um, to do something similar in the marmoset monkey. And uh, Marcelo has over a period of a decade placed um, uh, retrograde injections in a, um, not in a grid-like manner, but he's actually covered quite a bit of cortex. Um, and these injections, he has subsequently digitized all the retrogradely labeled cell bodies. He apparently has about 300 injections at this point. And he also has the uh, corresponding missiles and uh, myelin stain sections. We are trying to gather that data set together to produce um, computational um, uh, co-registered maps. Uh, this is uh, uh, reconstruction carried out by Tristan uh, Chaplin uh, from uh, Marcelo's lab. Um, so uh, we actually have Marmoset data set that should be released on our website uh, shortly. Um, I, uh, okay, so this is something we are doing on the side by using um, uh, nuclear labeled uh, cells from Jaw Shuang, where we can do cell counting. Um, so wh what's happening here is that uh, the individual nuclei of uh, subtypes of GABAergic neurons are labeled. Um, these are cream mice uh, with a uh, uh, construct that localizes to the, to the neuron. We are able to then pull out the cell bodies, and the idea is to characterize the densities of these things in space. I, I show you this to um, uh, show that there are computational challenges that have to be uh, overcome, but also interesting statistical problems that can be uh, addressed here. Um, here it is just for cell counting, but you can imagine that when we are injecting and we are counting retrogradely labeled cells or when we are characterizing anterograde processes, similar uh, statistical considerations will, will apply. Uh, what is being shown here is in a small part of uh, uh, the uh, section, all the cells centers have been detected this, this is being done using confocal microscopy, but then we can correlate the uh, detection in this 3D plane with the 2D, just the 2D optical sections, and therefore calculate a calibration factor for doing stereological um, counting. And those are all the detected cells in a 2D section. One can um, then compute densities. Um, one can go beyond densities and start asking questions about spatial statistics. So for example, if you get the spatial pattern of cells, you could ask, uh, are they random? So for example, if they form a Poisson process, would anyone like to take a guess if this uh, set of points in the plane are randomly distributed, or is there a structure? How many people think there is a structure? Nobody? How many people think it's random? Okay, and some of you are undecided. Well, how do you decide um, if it's random or not? Well, that's also a good question. So, completely random, which is Poisson. So, by, by looking, it's hard to tell, right? One, one needs. More uniform than Poisson. Well, so one needs a statistic. You, you think it's more uniform than Poisson? Okay, so well, it's a testable hype, you know, yeah. it's a testable hypothesis. How do you test it? I mean, this there should be some uh, there should be some right? Right, right. So, so the question is, you know, now we can start asking questions like this. This is one of the proto questions one can ask with just geometry. Um, and so this is the density, by the way, um, 10 to the 4 per uh, cubic uh, millimeter. To ask the question whether it's uh, random or not, one can, uh, Poisson or not, um, one can uh, uh, do it in this manner. One can take the largest sphere around a point that just touches the 
closest neighbor. And for a Poisson process, uh, this has an exponential distribution. So that gives you a null hypothesis. And if you test it, um, this is just uh, plotting the, uh, one, one can do a Z transform and then uh, do a, a um, empirical uh, cumulative distribution. Um, you can look at, the null hypothesis would be that it's just this straight line. And uh, the null hypothesis is not rejected in this case. So in fact, according to this statistic at least, what you saw, we cannot reject the Poisson distribution. However, um, same slice, we go to the caudate nucleus and you look at the uh, scatter of cells and now it actually, even by eye, it looks quite non-Poisson, looks clustered and uh, the density is, uh, is higher. Um, and in fact, the null hypothesis is nicely uh, rejected. Um, you can see that it's not Poisson. But is this the distance? Is that, does it say that what is uh, the, oops, sorry. Uh, it, it is the uh, QQ plot, so low values are suppressed of the intercell distance. Um, yeah, so they are basically uh, um, there's some repulsion between neighbors. So are these the pericaria you're plotting? Uh, what is causing this? Uh, no, plotting the, the distribution of the pericarya, the cell bodies of neurons? No, I'm plotting the distribution. So I've detected all the points, uh, which are the centers of the cell bodies. I've, ca I've calculated the distance, pairwise distances between all. Actually, I'm calculating the nearest neighbor distance. But why are you attributing the importance to the cell bodies with regards? To Sorry? The why are you attributing the importance to the cell bodies with regards to the distribution of neurons? When you Oh no, that, that's a very good point. I'm just saying that this is, a, this is one geometrical question one could ask, but even this kind of elementary question has not been asked in the neuroanatomical literature. If you, people have barely started counting the number of cells, right? So when we first started doing this, I wanted to know what is the density of GABAergic neurons in the brain? Uh, the answer is you don't really know because people haven't <laughs> characterized these things. So in fact, Moritz is on a paper, one of the first papers, in fact, where such a quantitative character. We wanted to compare our uh, calculations of densities. Um, so we got, uh, for, for GABAergic neurons, uh, we get something between 10 times, 10 to the 3 to 10 to the 4, depending on where you are in the cortex of the mouse. And this number is consistent with um, interneuron density in the rat. Uh, but this is just densities. So what I'm pointing out is, you know, you can go beyond densities for even something as simple as the cell bodies. But you're right that as we start characterizing the processes, uh, we will have to ask uh, statistical geometric questions which have not even been posed so far. So uh, perhaps the point of you know, this little um, uh, subsection of my talk is that as we get uh, information from digital neuroanatomy, as we start building up the um, reconstructed neuronal arbors, we will be able to ask more questions than just what the connectivity matrix is doing. We'll be able to ask questions about the statistical distribution of the geometries of different cell types and so on and so forth. And this will be the equivalent of when people discuss you know, rate codes versus temporal codes. They are getting at um, questions that will have analogs uh, here just for um, the geometry. Uh, so this is, all, this is all really work in progress. But what I wanted to do, since you all have computers, um, if you would go to mouse.brainarchitecture.org, and I'm going to do it with you. Um, as long as I have access to the internet. So it's mouse.brainarchitecture.org. Um, if you go to brainarchitecture.org, you will see a, um, <clears throat> you, you, you'll see the front page um, where we also hope to put up data from other species. This is the mouse page. Um, so there are different ways of navigating. Um, 
let me just uh, uh, give you um, a quick overview. So there are three ways of navigating this website. If you, if you click on the Browse Images button, um, now I cannot predict what will happen when 30 people hit the website at once. We have done some stress testing, but uh, um, maybe a little bit slow. So if you go to Browse Images, you'll get a, a list of the brains by injection. So there's um, uh, sort of the region where the injection was placed, the stereotactic coordinates. Um, then you see the tracer that was used. Um, and it has gone off screen for me, but there is also this thing called a um, section gallery. Um, so let's say if I were to click on section gallery, then you would get this display here, which, oops. Um, allows you to navigate through the uh, through the brain. So there's a couple ways to do this. Um, so this this allows you to you know scroll through the different brain sections. Um, if you go to uh, Atlas uh, hierarchy, um, that's another way to navigate this particular website. Uh, what we did is broke the injections up into a hierarchical nomenclature provided by. Swanson, so you can expand these tabs and uh, zoom in on a particular. So we have a, right now a lot of injections posted on a, a somatomotor area, for example. So clicking on that would give you all the primary uh, motor cortical uh, injections, uh, for example. Then if you were to click on one of these brains, um, you should be taken to the uh, navigator, which will allow you to access um, the individual slide, um, individual section. You can select other sections by just clicking on this little tab down here. Um, you can expand, you can zoom in. And move this around. Um, so the zoom goes, as I said, you'll be able to zoom in on uh, until you reach about uh, half micron pixel size. Um, so if you want to know what that particular brain is, there is this little tab here called Brain Info. If you were to click on Brain Info, then you get these other um, auxiliary things. If you click on Allen Reference Atlas section, uh, that should take take you approximately to uh, the corresponding plate in the um, reference atlas for the mouse brain put up by the Allen Institute. So if you look at these side by side, you can tell which part of the uh, brain um, you're in. So I'm not going to uh, do that right now, so I'm going to close that. Um, you can uh, click on this these one of these two links to see what the BAMS database uh, tells. Uh, first of all, I guess I should say that you can see up here that the injection region and the injection coordinate and tracer are given. So this, this particular injection is in the primary motor area. You know, these are the stereotactic coordinates. This is the tracer. Um, so you might want to know, well, in the RAT, because there is this database of projections uh, into and out of the primary motor area, what are, what are those projections? And so if you were to click on one of these links, that should then link you out to the um, BAMS database. Um, and if this database is now up, we should be able to see a set of um, 
So those are lists of regions which re receive connections from MOP. And, and if you were to click on this little button here, you will in fact see the you know, actual reference from the literature, which um, you know, corresponded to that particular, uh, the, what they call a projection report. Now, one thing I should point out is that, so okay, so there are many regions listed here as receiving projections from MOP. Now, each many of these, uh, rep there are many reports in here, right? So there are many different papers. All you get out of that paper is a sentence saying there is a projection from MOP to this brain region, right? Um, if you look inside that paper, you might get a photograph. If you're very lucky, you might get some quantification. So, so that whole uh, set of information that is now scattered among papers and you know, in somewhat condensed form is in some sense also available in these raw images. Um, so that's you know, kind of the uh, point that I was trying to make um, earlier. So now if I go back here, uh, one more thing you can do is you can um, look at the corresponding uh, section, uh, uh, the adjacent section of the brain stained with missile. Um, and this is useful if you are uh, doing neuroanatomy. This is also zoomable. Um, it tells you, it gives you precise localization as to where you are. Um, How many of you actually do uh, anything to do with tracer-based um, neuroanatomy? Do any of you have, uh, any of the students have? Okay, so this is all kind of news to you. Um, but um, if you're doing any modeling work and are interested in looking at projections between brain regions, and it so happens that we have done that injection, you know, then this uh, data is certainly available for you to look at. So the only other thing that I want to point to here is um, one more thing I should point out over here is if I were to, um, so here it just looks yellow, but that's because the images are uh, saturated. This is one of the problems with dynamic range. If you zoom out, uh, if, if you adjust the um, colors, uh, you can in fact unsaturate the image. These are 12-bit images, and it's uh, not possible to display 12 bits simultaneously. Um, so that's why um, I want us to do it like this. We probably can nonlinearly uh, scale the images. But so if you zoom in, you can now see these are the individual cell bodies in the injection um, region. Okay, I think that sort of gives you an idea about what this website looks like, and I uh, uh, sort of invite you to uh, play with the data set. Um, I found it very instructive to simply, um, let's take uh, that uh, particular section. So here we can see um, cortical um, projections in two different parts of the brain. And, and one thing I should note is that, uh, um, for example, the part of the brain that Moritz was talking about, he'll be mapping, ma mapping out using electron microscopy, will correspond to a region you know, roughly about that big. right? So by using EM, we can maybe look very closely at what's going on inside that small region. Um, and by looking at these images, we can find out what the larger scale um, projection patterns are. Um, this project is in progress. Um, if any of you are interested in this data, uh, I, I am in, you know, sort of inviting uh, people to both look at it informally, but if you want to look at it more seriously, want to have access to the data or things like that, please uh, feel free to contact me as well. Um, I think I'm going to uh, stop.
stop there and allow Moritz to do the remainder of his EM tutorial. But it's also later. It's not what, what, uh, what would people like to do? We should take a vote. I mean, if people are interested, then. It's, it's really critical. OK. All right, well, if you have any questions about my talk, you can ask me separately.